Nigel, thanks for joining Spectator TV. Not at all. It's been a good week for the Reform Party, with the Tory party's former deputy chairman, Lee Anderson, defecting. He once said not so long ago that he never would. What do you think changed his mind? He's on a journey, isn't he? And by the way, it's not just Lee. Millions are on a journey. Millions of people from families who voted Labour since 1918, right? And generation after generation voted Labour. That was their tribe. That was their identity. And in the 2010s, because of Europe, immigration, they started voting UKIP, a Brexit party. And I was the gateway drug to a 2019 massive Boris victory, you know, the 80 seat majority. And there's something like perhaps two and a half, 2.75 million people who've been on that journey all the way from Labour, all the way through. And if you look at red wall polling, you know, you will now find the champion of the red wall, Boris Johnson, 50% of that red wall now think he did a disastrous job. And so Lee, coming all the way across to reform, is not on his own. A lot of people are going there. What do you make of Boris Johnson's legacy? He did deliver Brexit. And? That's something you've been calling for for many decades, Nigel. I agree. And after that, what? We had COVID. We had lockdown. Well, you're right. We've had the small boats. He did that. That was very good. Uh, we've had um, taxes going up to the highest tax burden, the highest since, since 1948. Uh, the level of state control over our lives exploding, um, restrictions on choice uh, as, as, as to what we can do with our own lives. Under Johnson, the state got bigger in every sense, both in control of our lives and taxes. And you only have to, only have to look at the way the second and third lockdowns were handled to realise that. And the big one, the only reason Boris got there, the only reason Brexit got over the line was on the immigration issue. You know, which is almost not understood by anybody in this postcode where we're now discussing it. Um, you know, at least of all your editor, I'm sorry to say. No one understands this. Go out where real people live, see the change in their communities, see the impact on their incomes, see the opportunities they have to get GP appointments or their kids to get houses, and you realise that the population explosion is the biggest single factor that has damaged the quality of life in this country. It, is, it, 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 it outstrips everything. And what you've had under Boris is record levels of immigration, even in his best years, 10 times the post-war average. Think about that, 10 times the post-war average. And last year, albeit under Sunak, 20 times the post-war average. Well, if you don't like what my editor says about immigration, you'll be horrified to hear what I say about it, but we can have that well, debate yeah, but another you're all time. But you're all London lovers, you see. And, 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 you, and, and you don't want to say things that make you unpopular. And you've got no, I'm sorry, but you're not connecting with what's well, really yeah. happening out there. You come with me around a council estate this Saturday and you'll come back, I promise you, with a very different view. I would love to do the immigration debate sometime. And to the point about unpopular opinions, as somebody who talks about our National Health Service quite a bit, very happy to go to the unpopular space. But I, I want to stick on Lee Anderson because this yeah. is a really important week when it comes to what we could be looking at in an upcoming general election. The new Conservatives, the group that Lee Anderson was a part of in the Tory party. Are they one of the five families or are they the something six? Something like that. Seven, eight, who it, knows how many there are now. It? But they're, they put out a statement really? which, you know, was critical of Lee Anderson for defecting, but also made very clear that they thought that the real problem lay with the government. Yeah. Do you expect to see more defections from Tory MPs? I think that depends. And, and bear in mind, this is important, I'm the honorary president. I'm not, I have no executive role in this at all. I do speak to Richard regularly, Richard Tice. Um, and yes, I'm cheering on from the sidelines, but I, you know, I'm not actively involved in this. I'm just a humble broadcaster. It's very important that we establish that. Objectively, I would say this. Let's see where we are with YouGov this Sunday and the following Sunday. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there's an Anderson bounce, because if there is, we're entering very, very different territory. Why do I say that? Well, the worst poll for the Tories last week had the gap between reform and the Tories at 5%. The one before that had a gap at 7%. Mm -hmm. If we start to get to a point, and that's national polling, if we start to get to a point in the red wall where people think, city MPs think, you know what, I've got more chance of reform than I've got with the Conservatives, then yes, I think we will see more defections.
But on that point about polling, the government isn't, a pos isn't in a position where it can lose much more. But reform does need to gain some. The national polls are not translating to by-election results. Well, that's not really true, is it? Because, I mean, the... the, the They're by disappointing. They're definitely towards the lower end of the spectrum, especially when we're looking at 35% Well, no, turnout. that's not true, is it? Wellingborough was slightly higher than the national polling. Kingswood was about in line with the national polling. But we're looking at 35% polling. of the turnout. If you were to do substantially well in a general election you would need to see better polling figures for this. And I would also point out that Reform Party has been hinting that they thought that they would be neck and neck with the Tories in the national polls well, last month. I don't know how many elections you've stood in, um, but I've been standing in elections for 30 years. And I can tell you that by-elections are very different than general elections. <laughs> yes, they are. Whilst in a general election, what happens on the ground matters. It doesn't matter as much as in by-elections. In by-elections, parties mobilise armies. You know, when the Lib Dems were on a roll, they could put a thousand activists a day into constituencies. Reform's weakness, and it's a big weakness, is it doesn't have the structure, doesn't have the organisation, doesn't have the history. So it's not able to put the muscle mm -hmm. into by-elections that UKIP was 10 years ago. You know, UKIP was very good at by-elections 10 years ago. However, in a general election, most of the vote is through air war as opposed to ground game. So I wouldn't for one moment dismiss the polls. Mm. Um, I want to ask you about Lee Anderson's defection specifically, because he was suspended from the Tory party. He had less to lose. The comments that he got suspended for <coughs> were suggesting that Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, was friends with Islamists, was controlled by Islamists. He mentioned that he thought Kiyostama also suffered from the same thing. This was widely condemned within the Tory party, really across no, the no, political no, no. Within spectrum. Westminster. Well, my question Widely you, condemned within so Westminster. My, my, my question to you, Nigel, is are those kinds of comments going to be acceptable within the Reform Party? You need to get out more. You all... No, I'm not, so, yes. I mean, so I'm, yes. Not, I'm not having a go at you. You need to get out more. I, I don't know whether you saw what happened in London last Saturday. Mm -hmm. Chants in the streets encouraging the Iran-backed Houthi terrorists to fire more missiles at ships, including British merchant ships. Not even touched upon by the police. A bloke standing up with a Hamas to terrorists placard, manhandled to the ground by six police officers. From the river to the sea, which is a genocidal phrase, put up on the Elizabeth Tower beneath Big Ben. Not a single arrest, even if the words and the way that Lee said it were a bit clumsy by his own admission. The sentiment behind it that we're losing the streets is, that is something that is shared by many millions of people. But Nigel, I think, I think this is the key distinction. Everything you just laid out there, many people in the Tory party, certainly people in and outside of this Westminster bubble, would agree with you. I'm talking about the words that he uh, used. We expect, um, don't we expect yes. slightly more from our yes. election representatives? Let's have no working class people in politics. I Let's don't think anyone suggests that. Over lower orders. I mean, Lee didn't even go to a public school, let alone a university. This is snobbishness. This is pure London snobbishness, and, it, and I speak as a privately educated person, all right, hands up, mm. but this comes, and I've seen it again and again, this comes from political parties and from media, they don't like common people, and Lee's common, he's working class, and therefore he phrases himself in a different way to those that went to Winchester But actually, do you think it's possible that what the criticism truly is, is about making a statement about the layer of money. No that one gives a damn factual. about the words. What they care about in the country in huge numbers is the sentiment that Lee expressed and the feeling. But do you think people should care about the words? So, th I mean, I'm, 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 I'm asking you, for a yes I'm or no giving, answer. I'm, giving you the, I'm telling you what's the, happening in this country. Right? I'm party. telling you, I'm telling you what I get at the petrol station every day. I stop to buy the newspapers. People of all ages come up to me. What the hell's happening to our country? What the hell's going on? What about us? And when Lee said yesterday, I want my country back, yeah, I get it. I absolutely get it. So the precise- Again, you're not talking about the same comments that I am, but I, look, no, no, I, I'm No one if, cares about the words. I, you care, ordinary voters don't care. And, and this is the disconnect. But people my question, don't get but, it. My question, Nigel, is whether or not you think people should care. Do we want to go down the Trumpian path in which they words are thrown yeah, out and 50% no. of the nation says that they don't care? I agree with you, everyone should go to Oxford. They should all have IQs of 140. Do you know what? Life ain't like that. So I don't think I'm going to get a yes or no answer from you about whether or not those comments are acceptable in their foreign party. I, I would note I, that you were no, talking no, no, about no, no, other no, no, comments, no, no, not no, the no. ones that I I'll mentioned. I'll give you my personal view of the yes. comments, right? They're slightly different. Yes. I'm explaining to you why I think Lee, why I think Lee Anderson would you make those comments? is going to be, hang on, I'm explaining to you why Lee Anderson is a bigger deal than anyone yet realizes, mm. right? This is about emotions. 
It's about emotions, it's about feelings. You know, but do people in Asheville care about the formal words they use? They couldn't give a damn. He's expressing an emotion. For me, yeah, of course, the way he put it wasn't quite right. I, you know, had he said Sadiq Khan has lost control of the streets, had he said Sadiq Khan uh, always goes on about uh, always goes on about, about Islamophobia, but never seems to criticise anti-Semitism. Very different, comments. and that would have been fine. Very important. So, point. so, so were the words perfect? No, they were far from perfect. Ah. But they express an emotion given by somebody, as I say, that is not Oxbridge educated and needs to be given a bit of leeway for that. I'd like to ask you about some of the policies in the Reform Party. You are honorary president. I'd like to know whether or not you support some of these positions. I've been looking into the reform policy around yep. tax, around the NHS. My first question is, why do you think it's going to be easier for the Reform Party or possible for the Reform Party to, for example, cut tax by tens if not hundreds of billions of pounds based on some of the public policies that are mentioned here, when it's been impossible with the current economic situation for the Tories to do that? And presumably it would be impossible for Labour to do it as well. Because we've not had pro-growth policies. We've simply not had pro-growth policies. And I think the, well, the virtual abandonment of small and medium-sized businesses, of sole traders, particularly under 14 years of Conservatives, is truly astonishing. You know, they may have got it all wrong. They may have been playing the right notes in the wrong order, to quote Eric Walker from a famous Christmas special. But, you know, when Kwasi Kwarteng stood up and said, we're going to review the IR35 rules. And I was cheering, cheering, watching it, because I know the frustrations out there for people trying to act as sole traders. Um, you've put up corporation tax, the government had by 30%. You've refused to accept the problem with the self-employed, with IR35 rules. Uh, virtually everybody in small business feels the world's against them. And whilst despite all of that, there are those that will thrive and survive and do well, if there is a lesson about enterprise that we can learn from Britain and America in the 1980s, it's when you make life easier, more people have a go. Mm. And we have not grown now since 2022. You know, we're now in a, they call it a technical recession, but we have literally flatlined since 2022. Um, and so, you know, we've, we're not generating, we're not generating the wealth, we're not generating the money, we're not generating the growth that we need to succeed. Now, if you, look at the, if you look at what Richard's put forward, Richard Tyson, his contract with the people, <clears throat> there's one key thing in it, which is the most expensive, right, back to your point, and that is to raise the threshold at which people start paying tax from 12 and a bit to 20,000 pounds a year. That is expensive. However, if it gets people off benefits and back into work and makes them more productive, it very quickly becomes less expensive. That is, if there is a gamble in what Richard's put forward, that is where it is. But it's an inspired idea, and I, and I, and I do believe it's the right one. Mm. You, you throw back to the Liz Truss era, uh, which at the time, um, well, we know how those 49 days went. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people wanted to point to tax cuts as being the problem. What they don't like to point to was the 100 billion pounds worth of extra spending that she was proposing in the energy yeah. price guarantee. Didn't end up being that expensive, but that is what she was asking the markets to borrow. And I think truly that is what blew up the entire project. No, I get that. But if I look at reforms, public policy, I <coughs> don't see a lot of mention of spending cuts. I'm, I'm looking at the NHS costs at well, the moment. Well, 5% spending cuts is what it says. But it's, it says 5% of the Whitehall budget will be cut. But you're also looking at huge increases in staffing for the NHS. You're looking at more money. That's actually one of the bullet points here. My question is, do you really think that this is going to be costed? I would expect reform to be held to the same standards as the Tory party or the Labour party when we're, we're well, looking at budgets, you, especially if you think it's going to perform well. All I can tell you from my own experience is that in 2015, the UK manifesto was independently costed by an outside think tank. The first time any British political party had ever done that. All right. So I have a track record in this regard. Um, it was interesting. After that, other parties started to follow, as with much of my life, other parties started to follow what we did. Um, it's up to Richard to get this knocked into shape between now and the next election. What he announced at the, at the reform conference up in Doncaster was, you know, the draft contract with the people. And that's what that is. So it's a work in progress, as indeed it is for everybody else. Perhaps the greatest likelihood of a huge reform success would be a huge Labour Party success, a but, huge majority. Well, they're going to win anyway. But how Labour wins 
could look very different and mean very different things for the country. Is this a 50 seat majority? Is this a 100 seat majority? Is it a 150 seat majority? That could determine what they can do with public policy, how much credibility they have when making major change. Yeah, it's quite the, funny. The, I sat here in 2015. I sat here with one of your predecessors in 2015, in not this room, one upstairs, uh, doing an interview, a print interview. And I was told, Nigel, you're going to cost the Tories seats. In fact, Cameron wouldn't have won a majority without UKIP because we took more Labour votes than we took Tory votes. Mm. So there's a lot of misconceptions going on here. Do you think that could happen again? I think this is different. Yeah. This is different in a sense. This is, those 2019 Boris Johnson voters, had, had 80% of them had come through UKIP and, 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 and the Brexit party. We were the gateway drug from old Labour through to that lending of the vote in 2019, which to be fair, Boris acknowledged the next day. He acknowledged that it was a lent vote. At least 50% of those Red Wall voters are now disgusted with the Tory party, disgusted verging on hatred for the Tory party. They will not be voting Conservative. And frankly, whether reform stand or not, they will not be voting Conservative. But then now, I go back to my here's original the key. question. Here's the key. Here's the key. Nobody alive knows more about the difficulty of the first past the post electoral system than me. No one alive. In fact, actually, no one that's ever lived knows more about the difficulties of the system. And I say that as somebody who led political parties that won two national elections, two European elections we won with me as leader, one for UKIP, one for the Brexit party, both under PR. And the one charge, big charge that I did for a general election in 2015, we get four million votes in one seat. You know, more votes than the SNP, the Lib Dems combined, the Greens applied, you know, and we get one seat. So I know all about this. I know how hard this can be. And I can completely understand, given the calculation, that in this election, it's 2019 lenders that will vote reform. So I understand the basis of the question. However, however, there's something different this time, and it's this. And this is why Lee's more important, I think, than anybody's yet realised. Reform's aim is to become the challenger to Labour in all of those red wall seats. And you know what? That is an entirely credible proposition. And if people who lent their vote to the Conservatives last time can see that only reform can beat Labour, or whether that's in Stoke or in Copeland, or, you know, or any of those, Ashfield, any of those constituencies, then we start to see a very different game. I think you're going to find within two weeks there are 20 or 30, putting my neck in, out here a little mm -hmm. bit, I think you'll find within a couple of weeks there are 20 or 30 red wall seats that are, have become already three-way marginals. Mm. And, and in which reform has a realistic chance. Now, is it going to be easy to beat Labour in those seats under first past the post? Well, given the corruption of postal voting and many other things, it won't be easy, but it's possible. And also, and also can, can I just say this? In 2015, there were a couple of million voters who had voted UKIP in the previous year's European election who went back to their traditional parties, mostly Conservative. They were worried about the SNP Labour coalition. They were squeezable. They're not squeezable now. They hate the Conservatives. Get this, they actually loathe the Conservatives for 14 years of lies. They loathe the Conservatives for 14 years of broken promises. There's something about the journalistic questioning now that is, that is missing something. Mm. And it's missing. These people, they'd probably rather not vote at all than go back to the Conservatives. So, so. I don't think the reform vote can be squeezed. I think it's a very, very solid 11, 12, 13% or whatever it is. It's not impossible that within a few weeks we see poll ratings where both parties are neck and neck. Ooh. It's not impossible. A few weeks is only a few weeks away. So we will certainly be coming back well, to those as predictions. I'm, but I'm sticking my neck out, but I, I do think that what Anderson does is gives reform a bit of, a bit of momentum. And the remarkable thing about the polls in the last few weeks is, or months, is that half the country still never heard of reform, Eerie. which makes it even more incredible. And that goes, point, that goes back to your point about ground game and turning out the vote. Yes. But I, I guess my, my question for you, Nigel, on a slightly more personal level, hmm. is if reform success well, if also leads to a bigger success for the Labour Party overall in terms of its ability to govern the country, in terms yeah. of its mandate, 
How will you feel about that? It would suggest that perhaps the public policy, the ideas that you like to push, will actually be further away. The tax burden may <coughs> grow. The state may grow. Yeah, maybe 100,000 young men without passports across the English Channel. How much worse could it be? How much worse could it be than what we've had under these conservatives? How much more of our lives could be controlled? How much more could we be filmed and fined? How much more could we be locked down? Can it really be that much worse? Well, it might be a little bit worse, but I'll tell you this. Very often in life, things need to get worse before they can get better. Mm. I repeat the point. As the general election approaches, people will know Labour have won already. So there'll be a huge battle going on for what is the opposition to that Labour Party. Is it the current uh, parliamentary Conservative Party? Or is it, dare I call it, the Conservative movement that exists out in this country, many of which enjoy the Spectator magazine and Spectator TV? And, and the reason I say that is I went to Manchester last year for the Conservative Conference. I hadn't been to one for decades. Now, albeit, I did go with a GB News badge on, but, you know, uh, the response was... And I was amazed. I was overwhelmed by delegates, you know, people who paid their own money, and it's damned expensive going to a, a conference. I was overwhelmed by, you know, people who'd gone to the conference of all ages, classes, all wanted to chat, really interested in talking, but most of the MPs walked by me like this. Mm. And so what you've really got going on in conservatism in Britain is the centre of gravity of the parliamentary party and the centre of gravity of Conservative members and voters are so far apart, it's almost unbelievable. And I think every vote reform gets in this election and the comparator between that and how many of the Conservatives get across the country is what will reshape the centre-right of British politics to come. And I'm not that pessimistic because I remember in the 70s, you know, I mean, I mean Heath, Heath literally tore up the 1970 manifesto. You turned on everything from you know, spending commitments to trade union agreements to uh, joining the European Economic Community. Um, and for all the world, you'd have thought when Heath went, you know, the whole thing was really in a terrible state of decline. And, and the National Front in those days was really beginning to gain some ground and some quite senior public figures backing it. And yet, out of the ashes of that emerged a new kind of thinking that we have to roll back the frontiers of the state. Um, and it was called Thatcherism, but it wasn't really Thatcherism. It was really Keith Joseph, Milton Friedman, or one or two others who, who developed a philosophy that we'd gone wrong. And we're in a very similar place now. They called it butskalism, you know, from the early 60s to the mid 70s, where effectively there wasn't much choice between Labour and Conservative. There's no choice now. You know, you're telling me, oh gosh, it could be worse than the Labour. Look at the budget. You know, Starbuck can criticise the budget, but actually agree with almost every single policy that was in the budget. We've got two big state, high tax, open border, social democrat parties. The difference is one just lies at every election. They lie at every election. You know, 2010 manifesto, net migration tens of thousands a year. 2015 manifesto, net migration tens of thousands a year. 2017 manifesto, net migration tens of thousands a year. 2019, a sort of vague pledge to cut numbers. Last year it was 750,000. Mm. I mean, these are, this is unthinkable. They don't deserve our votes. They deserve to get an appalling result. And if they do, then I think we'll see a one-term Labour government. And maybe that's better than having a faux Conservative party that lies to the electorate and never, ever delivers. So I'm actually quite excited. I, I, I think the reshaping... In a sense, in 2019, we reunited the centre-right vote, and I helped with that. I withdrew candidates in 320 seats. I said it was OK to vote for Boris. And I, I did all those things. But we didn't reunite the people on the centre-right. And we learn that basically... Most people who finished up in that cabinet post Boris's election were just lying to the electorate. We've had enough. You say you're excited. You say you want to be a part of this. You also said at the start of this interview that you are just a humble broadcaster at the yes. moment. Will you be a candidate for reform? The, the, these are very, very big calls for me to make. Um, I spent nearly 21 years in the European Parliament. Uh, it was a very large chunk of my life. Um, I've well, I haven't reinvented myself. I'm still doing the same thing. I'm campaigning. The jungle didn't reinvent you. The jungle did me a massive amount of good. Uh, the jungle took years off me. I mean, I, no, I, honestly, I feel fitter and younger than I am going to be 60 in a couple of weeks. So you'll be out knocking on doors and with I, your well, face on, on a leaflet? Hang on, hang on, hang on. The jungle did me an absolutely massive amount of good uh, and connected me to a huge number of young people. And that's why now, even on TikTok, you know, I'm the most active political current affairs figure in the country. 
you know, and I'm reaching out to teenagers uh, and I'm getting great heart actually from Gen Z and many in Gen Z. I have to decide what I can do best. Uh, I look at America, particularly at Fox News and you look at Tucker Carlson or, or you know, people like that. Um, would they have been more influential on American politics as senators or congressmen than they were with their Fox News position? So I have to think, you know, I've got about 4.2 million people now on my social media feeds. I've got a show on GB News that, you know, and I, I don't want to sound like Piers Morgan and, and boast, but, you know, over the last few nights, my viewing figures, even according to Barb, which is owned by ITV, Sky, or BBC, but even according to that measure, my show's getting more views than all the other channels put together every night. So I am above all, I'm not a politician, I'm an issues campaigner. I've always been an issues campaigner. You know, I stood for the European Parliament because I wanted to get three letters after my name because those three letters after my name got me on question time, got me a bigger audience. I'm an issues campaigner. I passionately care about things. I must work out where can I be most effective. Can I be most effective as I am? Broadcasting, social media ring, but not in a traditional way. I don't do it every night from a London studio. I'm out all around the country with live audiences, doing my stuff, or would I be more effective you know, getting back involved in electoral politics. This is going to be the second time in this interview that I'm not going to get a yes or no answer from you. I don't know. No, I'll tell you why. I don't know. Mm. You're I deliberating. No, look me in the eye. I genuinely don't know what I'm going to do. It is something that I think about probably for several hours every day. So I, seriously I, deliberating. Oh, oh, this is one of the biggest decisions of my life. Hmm. Well, let me ask you as a final question. Uh, if you didn't stand for reform, might you be spending more time in the United States? I know that you were reporting <laughs> over there for Super Tuesday. I know that you're in touch with the former yeah. president of the United States, yeah. Donald Trump. Is that something you might consider, taking up a job in the Trump administration if he were to be reelected? I was I was in Mar-a-Lago last Monday. For a day? Uh, with him. Extraordinary man. I mean, I, he's the most resilient human being I've ever met in my life. He's also one of the funniest. I mean, he's genuinely funny when you're with him. And Is he still funny? He seems quite oh, angry yeah. these oh, days. Oh, no, no. Look at that CPAC speech. 35 minutes of that speech. I mean, he could have been a stand-up comedian. He was telling stories. It was extra I mean, I'd have paid to go to the theatre and hear it. Um, he, he's going to win. He's going to win. I, of course, for me, the easy option is to up sticks and go to America. You know, I get a, I, I get a show tomorrow on American talk radio, probably get one on telly. I mean, I could do all that. The money would be a lot better than it is here. Um, of course, I'm very friendly with, I've been loyal to Donald Trump since 20, since the summer of 2016. I'm friendly with many of his family members, his entourage, and they trust me. I've never betrayed them. I've never let secrets out, you know. Um, so it is, a, in a sense, a very tempting world. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm English, I'm British. Uh, I quite like cricket. Uh, I quite enjoy it things about this country. Uh, I've got children. I've got grandchildren on the way this summer. Um, I've got parents who are still alive. Ooh. So my stake here is considerable. And I care about the future of the country. The only job in America that would really tempt me um, would be with a Starmer, it's probably not going to happen, but with a Starmer administration that has no connections to Trump who's going to win. You know, they need somebody in the middle of that in Washington to help them. You want to be Sama's ambassador to the US? They're going to need someone. Well, you're putting that I, out there. I Let's see you, if Labour gets in what, touch. I tell you what, if it's not me, who's it going to be? Because whatever David Lammy thinks of Donald Trump or says about him, or Sadiq Khan or whatever it may be, the fact is, you know, we are still the biggest investor in the USA from overseas. They're our biggest investor here. Uh, the trade links are huge, but could be so much better. And NATO is a very, very important organization. And if you don't, if Britain and America aren't together, the thing may fall to pieces. So the stakes on that are very, very high. Am I going to emigrate to America? No, I'm not. I'm not. Tempting though it is, I'm not. If I was asked to do a job that might help the national interest, I would. I doubt Labour will ask me. I very much doubt they'll ask me. Their prejudice against me would be too great. But you know what? It might just be the right thing for the country. Nigel, thank you so much for joining Spectator TV. And if you do end up spending more time in the States, you have to promise that before you go, you'll come back and we'll do a proper immigration debate. I promise. All right.